Hello and welcome everybody to Carbon Pricing and the Constitution, hosted by the Centre for Constitutional Studies in the Faculty of Law at the University of Alberta. I'm Pat Parody, the Executive Director of the Centre, and um, I'll be moderating this session. So usually at our events uh, on the University of, Campus, of Alberta campus, we acknowledge the uh, territory we are on. And this being a webinar, many of you are spread out across the country, some of you in other parts of the world. And so I'd encourage you to reflect upon the land you inhabit at your respective location. And I would like to respectfully acknowledge that the Centre is located on Treaty 6 territory, which is the traditional gathering place for many Indigenous people, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, and uh, Soto, Inuit, and others, whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to enhance our vibrant community. So before we begin, I'd like to point out that the chat function during this webinar has been disabled, but audience members will be able to go to the bottom of their screen and you'll see the Q&A button there, so you'll be able to ask questions using that Q&A button. Each speaker is going to present for approximately 15 minutes and the last speaker, Jocelyn Stacy, will be playing a five minute video clip. So given that the webinar will last for about 90 minutes, there should be ample time for, for your questions. And the speakers will attempt to answer as many of your questions as possible. I, do, I want to mention that you'll be receiving a short um, feedback form survey link after the presentation today and we'd really appreciate it if you would take a few minutes to fill it in. Uh, your, your feedback is extremely valuable to us. And lastly, please note that the webinar is being recorded and that it will be available on our website. Okay, and so to begin, um, the Supreme Court of Canada will be hearing arguments about whether the Greenhouse Gas Pollution, Pollution Pricing Act, the GG, PPA is constitutional tomorrow and Wednesday. And the question of the GGPPA's constitutionality, and that is whether the federal government has the jurisdiction under the Canadian Constitution to enact the GGPPA, um, has been heard and decided by the Alberta Courts of Appeal in, uh, by the Courts of Appeal in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Ontario. The Saskatchewan and Ontario Courts of Appeal found the federal government did have the authority or jurisdiction to enact the GGPPA, Alberta's Court of Appeal did not. And so the Supreme Court of Canada will be deciding that issue. This webinar is designed to provide you with a better understanding of the GGPPA and the constitutional issues that will be heard by the Supreme Court. To that end, we have three excellent speakers presenting today and they will be doing so in the following order. First, Andrew Leach is uh, an energy and environmental economist and is associate professor at the Alberta School of Business at the University of Alberta. He has a PhD in econ economics, a BSc in environmental sciences. And in addition to his teaching and research load, he's currently working on his LLM in the Faculty of Law at the University of Alberta. His research focuses on constitutional law and climate change. Andrew has researched energy and environmental economics and is particularly interested in climate change policies. He's a prolific writer, has been a consultant to governments. As our first speaker, he will be providing the context within which the GGPPA was enacted by the federal government. He'll be followed by Eric Adams, our second speaker, uh, who is Vice Dean and Professor of Law at the University of Alberta in the Faculty of Law, where he teaches and publishes on matters of constitutional law, legal history, employment law, human rights, and legal education. He's won many awards for his teaching and research, including several article prizes for his legal historical work, the Provost's uh, Award for Early Career Teaching Excellence, and a Killam Annual Professorship in 2016-17 for excellence in research, teaching, and service. He's the lead legal historian on the Shirk-funded partnership grant, Landscapes of Injustice, investigating the internment, incarceration, dispossession, and exile of Japanese Canadians during the mid 20th century. And he's currently working on a manuscript on the history of Canadian constitutional law. Professor Adams has been a research fellow with the Center for Constitutional Studies since 2015, and he will be presenting on the ways in which the POG, peace, order, and good government power in the Constitution can be interpreted by the Supreme Court of Canada in this carbon pricing case. And Jocelyn Stacy, our last speaker, is an assistant professor at the Allard School of Law at the University of British Columbia. 
where she researches the ways in which the law creates, regulates, and prevents environmental crises. She is president of the Pacific Center for Environmental Law and Litigation, a nonprofit society dedicated to training law students and la uh, young lawyers in public interest environmental law litigation. She published the Constitution of the, of the Environmental Emergency in 2018, and she is currently examining how law regulates disasters as disconnected and exceptional events, rather than the result of climate disruption and is contrary to the experiences of those most vulnerable to disaster. Professor Stacy also works with First Nations on legal issues related to disasters emergency powers and Indigenous jurisdiction. And because today's webinar is largely about jurisdictional issues related to regulating carbon emissions, she will introduce a short video clip from a hearing involving BC's jurisdiction to enact the Environmental Management Act, which targeted transporting heavy oil through pipelines. So some similar uh, aspects there. So with all of that backroom, background in mind, and without further ado, Andrew, would you please begin? All right, thanks. I, I guess I need to reshare my screen here to get you all to be able to see it. So let's hope that this works. Do you see that effectively? Yeah, okay, perfect. So thanks everybody. The, the last time I participated in one of these panels, I ended up becoming a law student. So I'm not quite sure what, what the uh, stakes are here. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping it's not a PhD in law, although I may have written that many words as part of an LLM thesis. So my setup role here is really to talk to you about the challenge, the framing, how we got to where we are, this week, a little bit of politics, a little bit of economics, and, and on the edge is a, a little bit of the law. And so I thought I'd, I'd kick off with this, and, and I apologize, I had a little bit of a computer fiasco, so I haven't got the fully updated one, but the story is the same, is that when we think about greenhouse gas emissions in Canada and our, our history on this policy file, we've been really, really good at setting targets, setting goals, um, making international commitments, we've been substantially less good at meeting them. And so we had the Kyoto target for 2008 to 2012 at 6% below 1990 levels, which we didn't come close to meeting. We this year have a 2020 Copenhagen target, 17% below 2005 levels. There was maybe a chance that the pandemic was gonna take us down that far. I don't think the pandemic alone is gonna get us there. We're looking now at a 2030 target of 30% below 2005 levels, and now an updated 2050 goal of actually net zero, not uh, more aggressive than the 80% goal. And yet our policy measures, the existing liberal government frameworks, the carbon pricing, low carbon fuel standard, all of the stuff that we've put into place so far don't even have us on track. And so our, our consistent role in this country seems to be to commit to more aggressive targets while backsliding on measures. And we're seeing that even happening today as, uh, for example, the federal government today uh, acknowledged uh, equivalency for Ontario's greenhouse gas emissions pricing regime, which is less stringent than the federal price, while at the same time saying we're gonna do better than our 2030 target. So we're really back in this world of overcommit, underdeliver. Uh, where do our emissions come from, I think, is, is another important starting point for this debate that we're having about carbon pricing and the federal role. And as you look at this graph, I think this is probably against the regulations on my tenure, but I'm not 100% sure of that. Uh, but you can definitely see that Alberta stands out in, in two ways. One, substantially increasing emissions, and two, substantially more important emissions than uh, than other provinces. But what you'll see come out of this as well is essentially two or three different types of economies, Alberta and Saskatchewan, which are very oil and gas dependent, whereas Ontario, Quebec, and, and to a slightly lesser extent, BC, are more dependent on transportation, buildings, manufacturing, etc., in terms of generating their emissions inventories. So we have different provinces, different emissions profiles, different histories, 
and also very different industrial makeup behind it. And, and so what the takeaway from this should be is, you know, without the participation of certainly the larger provinces, we're not going to see Canada be able to reduce its emissions and we're not going to be able to look to individual provinces or policies in relation to any individual industrial sector as the sufficient and necessary conditions to meet our national greenhouse gas emissions commitments. If I flip that graph onto a per capita basis and think about how certain provinces fit in with our federal uh, targets on this, then it becomes even more stark. The federalism challenge, I think, almost jumps directly off the page. That if we think of ourselves as having a national greenhouse gas emissions target, commitment, duty, however you want to frame it, that on a per capita basis, Albertans and, and Saskatch Saskatchewanians are, are emitting more per capita because of the nature of our industry, not because they're mean people or don't care about this per se, but because of the nature of our industries, are emitting substantially more per capita. So we not only do we have a national challenge, a pan-industry challenge, but we also have a very important distributional challenge. So flip this on its head, the cost of climate change policies are likely to accrue very uh, much in Alberta and Saskatchewan relative to, for example, Quebec, BC, and even Ontario. And so this creates that tension, which has been around since Kyoto, of the look at the, for the rest of the country saying, well, Alberta and Saskatchewan are causing this problem. They're pushing us to higher and higher emissions. Alberta and Saskatchewan saying, you know, number one, it's not just us, it's our industry. Number two, uh, if you're talking about these policies and commitments, the cost of those commitments comes disproportionately uh, onto our provinces, not onto yours. So a little bit of a flavor of, well, it must be nice for you uh, far off in the Laurentians to talk about what we should do on greenhouse gases when those, uh, those policy challenges aren't uh, being pushed completely close to home. So when we look at, and these are emissions projections, so this is the same data on the first half of these little wedges, but it's pushed out to the right with Environment Canada's projections out to 2030. And I've also compared them with a prorated share of our 2030 emissions target. So if we said in 2005, we committed to 30% below 2005, let's push that out to every province. You start to get a flavor of the degree to which those types of national allocations or pie dividing contests or what have you are going to have very disproportionate impacts in particular on Alberta their pro rate, pro rata share would be a roughly 40% reduction in emissions versus Atlantic Canada, which is already on track to re meet or exceed uh, reductions uh, that are at that uh, national commitment rate. So there's a dividing contest here that gets very, very challenging. So where did we go on this? After Prime Minister Trudeau was elected, uh, he undertook what was called the Pan-Canadian framework process. And this was a document, it's hard to believe today, given where we're going uh, to the Supreme Court, this was a government that all but Saskatchewan, a document that all, every provincial government and the federal government, with the exception of Saskatchewan, agreed to in 2016. So what were we gonna do on carbon, uh, climate change in Canada? We were gonna enact policy where carbon pricing was the central component with a flexible approach applied broadly across the economy, introduced rapidly, with predictable increases over time, policies that would minimize competitiveness impacts, and would include revenue recycling for, uh, to protect vulnerable groups from consequences we don't want to have happen. And all of those things are exactly what is in the Greenhouse Gas uh, Pollution Pricing Act. It's a carbon pricing, it's a piece of carbon pricing legislation that meets all of these check boxes the problem or the roadblock arise, we, if we want to blame one person for it, we can probably blame Patrick Brown in Ontario. But what really happened was changes in government in not only Ontario, but Quebec, New Brunswick, Alberta, uh, as well as in BC, although BC wasn't, uh, wasn't impactful for, for pushing against this. The, and those new, newer conservative governments 
did not see the same rationale for the pan-Canadian framework as had been seen beforehand. And of course, there were also significant economic downturns related to the energy sector in Canada that, that pushed against this as well. So from an economist perspective, and, and this is what got me interested in the law initially, to, to be honest, from, a, from the economist perspective, you would look at it, the, the federalism challenge as follows. You look at the, the provinces and say, you know, they, they have, as you saw in the graph, they have different economic makeup, they have different emissions trajectories, they have different industries that are affected, they have different populations, different income levels, all of these sorts of things mean that the best choice in each individual province may be a different tool, it may be a different level of stringency, you know, left to their own devices, the different provinces are going to have different strategic um, reasons for engaging in reducing emissions. I personally argue that Alberta's reasons for engaging in reducing emissions are stronger than some other provinces because of the investment risk that we see for our oil and gas sector that we need to be leading, not following. Others would disagree with me on that. Uh, this subsidiarity push or uh, optimal local policy decision making is in tension with another key aspect of the economics of environmental policy, which is something technically called the equimarginal principle. But basically what that says is the more broad and the more coordinated your policies are, the less costly to the economy writ large they will be. So if you want to reduce emissions and create the incentives to innovate, to come up with low carbon solutions, the best solution for that to accomplish those two goals with the lowest total cost to the economy is going to be a carbon price imposed nationally on every time. Now we know as economists <clears throat> that that's not necessarily going to be the right solution for a number of reasons. One is the uh, trade exposed sectors where people can decide to relocate as opposed to uh, reduce their emissions and that's not a desirable outcome if simply production locates elsewhere rather than driving emissions down. And we also know that carbon pricing has substantial or can have substantially negative impacts on low income communities, <clears throat> low income Canadians and, and displacement effects on the employment side. So you need policy that addresses those. But here's where, and this is what got me interested in the law, was that economic rationale runs headlong into the constitution and, and economists study optimal decision making under constraints. So this is how we think about the world. You are trying to purchase products, but you face a budget constraint. You're trying to produce products, but you have a technology or production constraint. What, the, what are the best things for you to do? One of the things we don't look at very much is what constraints does the constitution place on our ability to set the right policy or the best policy. And I think the thing that was maybe most eye-opening for me was that the things that we consider gospel as economists, cost effectiveness, e efficacy of policy, et cetera, it's not even that they, they don't carry the day, it's that they explicitly do not matter when it comes to the choice of, of the, or when it comes to assessment of the division of powers. So, you know, whether you look at securities or firearms, the Morgenthaler case, uh, or the anti-inflation, which is probably the closest parallel to the Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act case, I, I think. Um, whether or not the federal government is best placed to do this is for all intents and purposes irrelevant to the question of the validity of, of the legislation. So I've spent a year trying to understand that and work my way through it. I think I have my, my head around it, but this always comes as a substantial shock to my economist colleagues. So, this week, uh, we get to decide uh, whether or not the government can do this thing. How am I doing for time? Uh, my timer is resetting here on me. Pat, or can you give me a time cue here? Okay, perfect. Thanks, Eric. So the decision this week, it's not probably as broad as, as some would like it to be. The question is whether uh, the federal government can enact this Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act, which is uh, the particular piece of legislation that invokes a federal carbon price. And I, I want to spend a couple of minutes just talking about what does this legislation actually do? Because I think even in the appellate court judgments, it's been mischaracterized. 
So for all intents and purposes, it has two meaningful parts. The first part effectively imposes a carbon price on all emissions. It's imposed as a fuel charge on, in any province that's listed in a schedule to the act. So when the act was uh, first enacted, it applied nowhere. It did not have any provinces listed in the schedules. Those were added later. So it was basically a tax on nothing initially. Part two of the act includes a separate regulatory regime for large emitters. But what basically this does is reduce the average cost of part one to those trade exposed emission sectors. It gives them some emissions for free, what an economist would call an output based allocation of emissions credits. So it's basically a carbon tax. And if you qualify for part two, you're getting some emissions credits back or an output subsidy to compensate you for the cost of the carbon price. This is important because I feel like the courts and a lot of the discussion has mischaracterized this legislation. Number one, it does not in any way invalidate, override, interfere with provincial legislation. And I would argue it's the same parallel as saying, well, prop federal income taxes or federal sales taxes apply in provinces. Those do not by na their nature interfere with provincial income taxes in any particular way. The province can still enact income taxes. And importantly, the led, and you know, when I designed this, uh, the policy or helped design policy for Alberta, I fought back extensively against the language of performance standards or benchmarks and like the uh, language of allocations or subsidies because this is what the legislation does. It does not tell you that you can't operate an emissions intensive facility. If you want to start a tire burning factory in Ontario today, you can start that and there's nothing that the GDPPA does to prevent you from doing it. Other legislation might, but the GDPPA doesn't. So why do I, I think this is important and this will pivot into what Eric's going to talk about is how have the courts talked about this legislation so far. In Saskatchewan, Chief Justice Richards talked about it as establishing minimum national standards of price stringency. Uh, Associate Chief Justice Hoy and Chief Justice Strathy in Ontario picked up on this, establishing minimum standards to reduce national greenhouse gas emissions, minimum national standards for pricing. It sounds like very heavy handed federal legislation. Alberta was much more, you know, it's regulating greenhouse gases, it's, it's assessing the environment. <clears throat> But I actually think all of these miss the point of what it does. It's a selectively applied federal carbon price. And importantly, and this is my next to last slide. Uh, so Eric, this should cue you up to, uh, to kick off. You know, the federal role here is, is subjective. It's applied nowhere by default. So this is a little bit of a difference from our usual approach in environmental policy, which is a federal law that applies everywhere for which provinces kind of appeal, beg, plead, ask, et cetera, for equivalency or exceptions. And, you know, it's kind of ironic that this GGPPA has been presented as a heavy handed federal hammer when it's probably amongst our set of, of federal environmental regulations, it's the least federal hammer like of, of any of them. So that's a little longer than I'd hoped to go. I apologize. I, I had a timer running in a different way back here, but you know, I think takeaways, we have a significant emissions challenge, we need to deal with it. I think the federal government has the already proven capacity to, to legislate in this way, and I think the GGPPA is part of that. But importantly, the legal challenge, it's very unique. I don't think there are a lot of parallels to it in our legislative history, either environmentally or otherwise. Uh, but that said, I, I'm fully on side with the idea that they are really that quintessential national concern, but there's still this very important aspect of what does the legislation do and enable that uh, steps into the, the traditional domain of the provinces. So with that in mind, I'll, I'll turn the floor over to Eric. Hello, everybody. Uh, is the sound good and the screen being shared? Fantastic. Lovely to see, uh, see everyone and uh, to be part of this terrific panel, especially given my regard for both the Center for Constitutional Studies and my co-panelists um, whom I've worked with on the past in thinking through some of these tricky issues. You, you know right away you're, trans, uh, you're being transformed from uh, the hands of an economist 
with data and graphs into the hands of a law professor with bullet points and the odd picture. Um, but uh, that's what you're getting um, because I want to talk about POG, peace order and good government. And there are lots of ways to think about this um, case. And of course, I will not be able in my time to cover all of them. But from the outset, I have been fascinated by the way in which this case from the beginning was stamp marked by choices that the drafters of the legislation made and by the Department of Justice uh, federally who said, this is our case for the national concern branch of POG. They knew that that was a riskier strategy than they might have otherwise uh, pursued. Um, but they pursued it uh, anyway. And maybe this is uh, the emblematic case for this particularly difficult um, historic branch of POG, that is what is what falls within the national concern branch of POG, if there is such a branch, and some would um, raise that question. And um, that's what I wanna talk about, so let's, let's get to it. I want to just start with some things that are going to maybe sound like um, truisms and uh, beyond the obvious, um, but I think it's important for me anyway to indicate that um, I take federalism and the division of powers particularly seriously as a foundation of Canadian constitutional law, and I think that um, that those lines have uh, meaning and that uh, both the a federal government that overreaches its constitutional boundaries or, or a province that does the same um, should be struck down as unconstitutional. I also think that, that federalism doesn't work unless there is a central balance uh, between the jurisdictional authority of both levels of government. There were, there were elements in the conception of the Constitution Act of 1867 which might have allowed uh, the federal government to slowly uh, eat away at provincial jurisdiction over time. And courts, I think, have necessarily said we will not have a federal set of arrangements if that occurs. Um, and I think that that was an important early uh, line of thinking and it's and it served this country reasonably well. So I, again, take that uh, seriously. Um, and I, and I think that that has to be part of the, the mindset that uh, contemporary judges uh, and courts who look at these kinds of division of powers questions uh, remain mindful of, uh, that, our, that, our federate, that our federalism uh, makes sense at the end of uh, the day. And in my view, uh, and this is where not all will, dis well, where not all will agree with me, um, but that's okay, welcome to my dinner table. Um, that POG can be a part of this equation. And that indeed it's improper to read peace order and good government out of a proper balanced federalism in this country. For, so for me, POG has a role. And for me, the tools of constraining POG to make sure that it does not fundamentally unbalanced federalism already exist within our toolbox. I do not think they need to be invented in this case. I think they need to be applied in this case. Okay, well, I think if I'm going to focus on POG, it makes sense to at least pause with the section itself, just because we uh, rattle off this acronym uh, so uh, frequently, I think we maybe don't spend enough time with the, the text itself. And POG for me exists in an interesting world, almost unlike any other provision of our constitution in that I think I'm right in saying this. For me, it is the only provision of the constitution that has taken on a life beyond the bounds of the constitution. And I would include in that list, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, who um, it's hard to hear being quoted uh, in parliamentary debates um, and in, in popular constitutional culture. Well, that's not true of peace, order, and good government. We have reframed this idea as something intrinsic to Canada, as a kind of lodestar for our constitutionalism. And when I searched cancered debates for a piece um, that may appear in the Globe this week, we're just checking on the timing, um, I, was, I was not surprised, but I was pleased to find how often 
peace, order, and good government is referred to by all political stripes, by all politicians, drawing deep on this notion that something within peace, order, and good government should guide how we govern ourselves. And frankly, from, from where I sit, you could do a lot worse than this concept, especially as we see in, in times of, of crisis, be it a pandemic, be it a, a, a climate emergency, that if we could hold on to the notion of peace, order, and good government, we would all, I think, be in a better uh, place. So I'm not going to talk very much more then about this ideal of POG um, because it actually is also constitutional text. It is a grant of power to the federal parliament to do certain things, not to do everything. And you'll notice in the section that I have bolded that it says quite clearly that POG already is being carved, is being narrowed by, a, by an enormous carve out which is what POG is not, are those powers that are held by provinces. So the principle that we in the law would call mutual modification is that the division of powers has to always be read against one another to find its true meaning. And so what it means to me is that POG does have existence beyond the domains of provinces. But, but number two, but there must be such a domain. So let's talk about it. Well, if, 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 it, if it means something, then we still have the question of, of what um, and, and what kinds of laws is it going to authorize. And I think that is going to be at least part of the major background to this particular case. Um, a revisit, perhaps, of the, the, the conception that we teach every law student, that it exists in three branches. Um, Crown Zellerback, the, the, the most recent decision, which is in 1988 on this topic from the Supreme Court, sort of says three branches at one point. At other points, they suggest maybe the gap branch and the national concern branch are, are commingled into one kind of branch. There are some scholars who would question whether or not there is a national, a true national concern branch that is alive and well today. Um, I'm not quite sure whether the court will want to revisit this schematic of three branches, um, but we will see. Critically, I think the court is going to have to deal with an issue that came up um, in the literature. And um, if I can recommend a piece by Andrew Leach on this called Seeing Double, which your Google machines can take you to, not while I'm speaking, that would be distracting. But right after uh, uh, we stop this webinar, Google Andrew Leach and Seeing Double and find the ways in which um, I think that one of the key is issues is, is what does POG do once it, once it grounds jurisdiction? Because there are comments in some cases and, and, and some academics have picked up on those comments in some cases to say that the only way that POG can work is to grab what is provincial jurisdiction permanently place it within federal jurisdiction and make it plenary and absolute, such that any ability of the provinces to formally legislate in relation to that matter has now come to an end. Effectively, that provincial laws which touched on those matters may effectively become invalid. Perhaps you have already garnered that I am not persuaded that by, by that particular notion of a zero sum transfer of authority, where I think it's completely out of keeping with modern federalism for one. And number two, I just don't think that's the way our division of powers operates. And it's certainly not the way we have uh, the division of powers operate over other broad federal heads of power. And I'm thinking in particular, of section 91.2, the trade and commerce power in which we allow to live alongside massive volumes of provincial economic regulation and very properly so. So fundamentally then I think at some level this is about what is the relationship between the subjects which may fall within POG and ongoing provincial legislation. Does that provincial legislation remain valid? And if it remains valid, what do we do in the event that there are conflicts between particular areas of both federal and provincial uh, domain? Finally, one of the 
aspects, I think, of determining whether or not something truly falls within the national concern branch of POG. And I've already mentioned how, in my view, such a branch must, by definition, exist because of the text of the Constitution itself. I think the court in Crown Zellerbach was right to say that those federal aspects of national dimensions subjects are those over which provinces are incapable of effectively regulating at the provincial level. And so maybe this brings in slightly, or maybe it waters down slightly Andrew's sense a moment ago that efficacy has no bearing to play in constitutional analysis. Well, in the main, I think that is, of course, right and true, and we do not want judges deciding whether or not laws are a good idea or a bad idea. That is not their job. And we should all, I think, want to question ourselves when we look at this constitutional issue, because it seems to me a bit uncomfortable the ways in which people who support the policy objectives of the legislation seem to line up pretty solidly on the basis of its constitutionality, while people who are opposed to the policy mechanism seem to also take the position that it's unconstitutional. I think we should be cautious about the knee-jerk reaction to do that. And I think we would hope strongly that those are not the kinds of questions our courts and judges are asking themselves. At the same time, this question of whether or not provinces are capable of effectively dealing with this regulatory issue, the rise in greenhouse gas emissions and the connection between those emissions and climate change, um, I think does raise real um, questions of, well, how, how does this work um, that courts will engage in? And finally, if we ask our federal government to not ask, if the federal government does possess this domain, can the balance of federalism be maintained? In my view, it can. Well, why do we have POG in the first place? Um, we like to think of this as this very special Canadian thing, peace, order, and good government. We're peaceful. We're orderly. We believe in good government. And yet, of course, like many things Canadian, perhaps we might be uh, disappointed to discover that it's not particularly Canadian at all. It's been around since the 15th century in various forms. It was basically a British boilerplate constitutional phrase used to transfer power from the crown to another entity. It showed up in our constitution, but it showed up in a lot of other constitutional documents as well, but for a purpose. And that purpose became pretty quickly apparent, which is you might need a ability as a federal government to deal with national emergencies. Uh, the First and Second World War were areas where POG was in operation to allow federal parliament to do things, some good, many bad, um, that it had no previous jurisdiction to do, but also new matters um, like aviation, um, which of course were not, is not conceived of in the 18th, or sorry, the 19th century, and you need an ability of a, of a government to regulate new matters. But here's the POG problem. You take this broad language of peace, order, and good government, do you effectively dwarf the balance uh, that the teeter-totter represents in overwhelming provincial jurisdiction? Um, I think not, for some of the reasons that I've already uh, mentioned. For one thing, the dominant tide of federalism is squarely in the line of thinking that levels and jurisdictional areas of government can, co can and should coexist, as opposed to be carved out one from the other in watertight compartments. That, for me, is perfectly in keeping with what um, Andrew Leach calls the positive sum theory, that you don't say when POG is found to, to, to pertain to a particular area that the provinces no longer have jurisdiction to also battle climate change. No, we have added and, and identified a new aspect to a subject. A new federal aspect is dealing with the national implications of greenhouse gas emissions. Provinces can still deal, in fact, they should deal with the provincial aspects, of which there are many, of oil and gas industry, uh, transportation, and climate change.
Pith and substance must continue to matter. So there are moments in the Alberta Court of Appeal judgment which would have found the law unconstitutional where you read about all the things that might fall by uh, under federal jurisdiction in this new bad world, like can you uh, drive a car to work or how far can you drive it? Can you take a vacation or how many vacations can you have? Could you have a second property? What, at what temperature would you need to set your home? Um, those all sound like bad things to say now fall within federal jurisdiction. That is not the law before us. I think as Andrew pointed out quite persuasively, the pith and substance of this law is about a national carbon pricing regime. And the question and the only question for the court in my view is whether such a scheme finds its validity in an existing domain of federal jurisdiction. Many of these I've mentioned, so I'll just run through the, the final two as I carry on, which is, okay, what do we do then with this happy world of overlap and concurrency that I'm saying is the dominant tide of federalism? What about the conflicts? Well, again, part of the last 30 years of federalism has been, I think, a very progressive salutary, salutary development in federalism, which is we don't need paramountcy to be striking down conflicts between laws. We only need to exact paramountcy to let the federal government prevail over provincial jurisdiction in cases of absolutely clear impossibility to comply with two regimes conflict or where there is a serious frustration of federal purpose. Those, I'm going to argue, are much less numerous in areas of policy overlap than we might think. So if a province wants to combat climate change and all of them claim to be of that view, then those regimes will have no uh, inability, in my view, by and large, to function alongside the federal regulation of greenhouse gases, which is to the exact same purpose. So uh, I'll wrap this up, Jocelyn, in a, in a moment or two. Um, I think POG can be constrained by, um, by the piece of legislation, by, 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 by focusing on uh, the particular piece of legislation that is before us. That is, we do not want courts as policy, they are not policymakers. Their, their job is not to mark out the boundaries of federal jurisdictional domain over the environment. There are going to be limits to the ways in which the federal government can pass laws in relation to environmental matters. The question is, is does this particular law exceed those um, limits? And again, in my view, um, finding a validity in federal jurisdiction in this area over the National Concern Branch does absolutely nothing to impair existing provincial laws over uh, areas that are important to various provinces. And, and that, again, I think is exactly how federalism is working in other uh, productive domains. Let's deal with conflicts in the, sh in the small number of cases that they arise through the doctrines that already exist to that, to that end. Alberta Court of Appeal uh, says that I'm wrong on virtually all of these things. Um, they, they say that, that POG can only ground jurisdiction where the matter would have fallen within section 9216 um, as a matter of a local private nature as part of the provincial residuary powers. I don't understand that logic or where the textual evidence of that uh, proposition comes from. Um, they also say that uh, the jurisdiction, if it's found under POG, will be absolute and plenary. I don't, uh, I'm not persuaded by that view. Why would this domain of federalism be an outlier to all other division of powers um, issues that I think the court is dealing with? And, and finally, the Court of Appeal doesn't find, isn't persuaded by the notion that there is a provincial inability to deal with this matter because, again, perhaps um, 
un under some difficult logic for me to understand, the problem is so immense that actually no you know, provinces can effectively make a difference um, nationally. Um, I think you know, these lines of argument at the Alberta Court of Appeal will obviously be, be fault lines that the Supreme Court of Canada is grappling with. A theory of POG at the end of the day must um, issue from this Supreme Court of Canada judgment. And given that it's an area of Canada that we have said is part of our intrinsic constitutional makeup and culture and guiding light, it's time for the Supreme Court to tell us just how and when and how POG can also be a reality um, in our constitutional lives. Jocelyn? Thank you for that. Okay, let me um, override you here and share my screen. Sharing. How about that? Okay. And we'll get this set up here. All right. How does that look? Can you hear and see, hear me and see my slides? Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this panel. It really is a privilege to be back um, alongside virtually my co-panelists. I'm joining you today from Vancouver, um, the traditional unceded and ancestral territory of the Musqueam people, where I'm happy to say that we are no longer ensconced in um, really choking wildfire smoke. Um, and so I'm uh, bringing a, a complementary perspective to what my co-panelists have already offered. I'm going to approach this litigation from the perspective of environmental law. Now, the goal of my remarks um, is really to explain the significance of this case to Canadian environmental law and to situate it um, with respect to past environmental federalism cases. Um, so I guess in that sense, you know, I'm, I'm going to maybe provide a slight sort of counterpoint to um, Andrew's observation that this case is unique. I think there are useful lessons we can draw from past uh, environmental law cases um, for this litigation. And then I also want to give you a sense of what folks in the environmental law world are really hoping and asking the Supreme Court to do um, with these cases. And I'll go over sort of two, um, two dimensions of those uh, aspirations. And then as as Pat mentioned at the outset, I'll um, provide a bit of an inter introduction to a, a short video that we'll have um, you watch. Okay, so very briefly, some background on uh, uh, or context on Canadian environmental law. So climate change is absolutely, you know, the preeminent challenge of our time, but it's by no means the sole environmental challenge that we face or have faced. So some examples of this biodiversity loss, plastics pollution, ocean acidification, all really pressing environmental challenges at a local, national and global scale. And I say this not to add to the background sense of doom that you might be already experiencing because of you know, the pandemic, um, but really so that we can pay attention to how past environmental cases have addressed these challenges and so that we appreciate the stakes of this type of decision not just for climate action in Canada, but for the full range of pressing environmental challenges that lie ahead. And as I'm going to show you, the Supreme Court weighs in relatively rarely on environmental issues um, and environmental federalism issues. So it's a significant, uh, it is a significant case by, by, uh, by any means. So um, a little bit of the doom part. Um, can uh, Canadian environmental law is not very good, right? And I think that we have, it's important to appreciate that um, when looking at um, a constitutional challenge like this. Uh, Canadian environmental law by and large lacks the kind of policy innovation that you see in other countries. We've been very slow to take up or experiment with market-based regulation, which Andrew provided, like pollution pricing. So Andrew introduced us to the scheme here and the economic perspective on that. Canadian environmental law is also characterized by extensive dis discretion to allow pollution which undermines transparent and science-based uh, environmental decision-making, which means that we really don't have firm ecological baselines that are being protected. And as a result, um, Canada does not do an effective job um, at achieving really strong environmental outcomes by and large. And we do an especially poor job um, at ensuring equitable environmental outcomes. So that means that environmental bur burdens and benefits um, are distributed really unequally across the country. And so that's the middle image on the screen there, some environmental 
justice or injustice hotspots that have been identified in the country. Now, one of the big reasons that is offered for the weakness of, Canadian, of Canada's environmental laws is federalism, right? So that we have really had very weak national leadership on environmental issues um, that have largely been driven by constitutional politics and not by constitutional law and the jurisdictional limits that are set out in, in our constitution. And in fact, a lot of the constitutional ambiguity that really shrouds um, shared jurisdiction over the environment is precisely the result of the fact that the federal government has really been unwilling to test some of these boundaries by taking stronger positions on environmental regulation. So with that background in mind, um, it's not surprising that we're in the situation that we're in, right, with this big Supreme Court of Canada challenge. It is a relatively rare example of federal initiative on a widespread environmental issue, and it's a rare example of policy creativity uh, in Canadian environmental law. And so, um, and so I, I suppose it's a good thing that we've got the Supreme Court of Canada um, wading in, into this. So turning to those past environmental uh, law cases can help us understand this litigation. Um, the core, core jurisprudence on the scope of federal jurisdiction over something as expansive as the environment uh, and environmental protection is really captured by less than a handful of decisions, all of which upheld challenged federal laws in these cases. So, Crown Zeller back, um, which is uh, the, uh, the POG national concern case that Eric mentioned, dealt with pollution by way of marine dumping, Friends of the Old Man River, a, fed, um, a challenge to the exercise of federal jurisdiction over environmental assessment, Hydro-Quebec uh, dealt with the federal government's attempt to regulate toxics under the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, which was upheld under the federal criminal law power. We also have a couple of subsequent um, decisions that deal with municipal and provincial jurisdiction on which the court has issued detailed reasons. Um, and so that's Spray Tech in 2001 and more recently the Orphan Wells decision. And these again reaffirm that all jurisdictions have constitutional space to carry out important pro environmental protection programs. So the key thing really from these three um, core cases on federal jurisdiction over the environment um, is that the majority in these cases concludes that Parliament does have ample scope to legislate over the environment, certainly not unlimited. Um, and I agree with everything that Eric has, has said already, um, but there is quite a bit of scope there. So how does this help us understand the carbon re uh, pricing reference and its implications for environmental law? Well, certainly from the perspective of environmental uh, um, observers on this, we really are looking for the court to do one of two things. Um, we're looking for the court to hold the line, right, so to continue to reaffirm that there is federal jurisdiction and scope to regulate over environmental protection in this way, um, or, you know, to do that and start to shift um, environmental federalism towards a broader sort of recognition of stewardship obligations over the environment. So let's start with holding the line. Um, so a good environmental outcome or good outcome for environmental law in Canada would be a decision that upholds the legislation and reaffirms that Canada and all jurisdictions have ample constitutional scope to legislate um, to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions. And I think um, we can see that this would hold the line um, by uh, looking at this quote which thing, from the Hydro-Quebec decision, which I think does a good job of capturing this. So Justice Laferre in the writing for the majority in this case says, the all important duty of parliament and the provincial legislatures to make full use of the legislative powers respectfully assigned to, uh, respectively assigned to them in protecting the environment has inevitably placed the burden on the courts, uh, placed upon the courts the burden of progressively defining the extent to which these powers may be used to that end. In performing this task, it's incumbent on the courts to secure the basic balance between the two levels of government envisioned by the Constitution. However, in doing so, they must be mindful that the Constitution must be interpreted in a manner that is fully responsive to emerging realities and to the nature of the subject matter sought to be regulated. So a quote that really illustrates an attentiveness to the kind of constitutional balance that, um, that Eric was just talking about, but one that is fully 
responsive to emerging realities and to the nature of the subject matter that's being regulated. So from an environmental law perspective, really an expectation that the court will continue to take an approach to constitutional interpretation like this, um, that's flexible and sensitive to the challenges of legislating with respect to the under, uh, underlying environmental issues. So the, what, what's going on in Hydro-Quebec, for those of you that haven't um, looked at that decision or haven't looked at that decision recently, you know, the majority in that case was very clear that the legislative scheme under CEPA, the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, that prohibited toxics necessarily looked different from sort of the classic form of criminal prohibition, right? And so we, and the court was comfortable taking a more flexible approach to um, constitutional interpretation, recognizing that that was nonetheless a valid exercise of the criminal law power in that case. Okay, so as already has already been discussed, the focus of this litigation really is um, is POG and then has been framed around the national concern branch of um, the peace order and good government um, clause. Uh, and I think, um, you know, Professor Adams, you've done a nice job of setting the out the roadmap for how the Supreme Court of Canada could really um, just apply what's already there um, uh, on POG to uphold the Greenhouse Gas uh, Pollution Pricing Act. Um, and, and I agree that the that POG national concern should be the primary focus in this case. Um, and I'll also sort of echo, I think, what, uh, what Andrew was saying earlier, that from an environmental perspective, this is a much easier case than Crown Zellerbach. Um, the extraterritorial effects of, um, of greenhouse gases are much clearer, much more pronounced than marine dumping uh, of forestry debris and provincial inability and the risk of provincial inaction in are also much more pronounced. And so this is a point that's being made by the interveners that are really attempting to show, you know, the court that this isn't as difficult a case as it may appear to be, you know, that you have the tools in Crown Zeller back to just apply that uh, to um, the circumstances here. Um, but you should also note that there are a number of different um, bases that have been provided to the court for how it can um, again, just apply what's already there in our constitutional jurisprudence that would still allow the court to uphold the federal legislation. So there are arguments around the emergency branch of POG, gap argument, if that's something that exists under POG, um, the criminal law power and trade and commerce. All of those um, are being put to the court in, in this case. And upholding the legislation on any one of those grounds would be a good outcome for Canadian environmental law because it would affirm that, reaffirm that um, the constitutionally permissible and appropriate role of uh, federal parliament in regulating national scale environmental issues. Now, um, one can hope, I guess, um, that you know, there might even be a better outcome here from the perspective of environmental law. And that's one in which the court starts to shift environmental federalism from a discourse over constitutional space to one that includes some notion of constitutional uh, responsibility. Uh, and so I'll map out those arguments in a moment. I'm calling this a stewardship shift. I've just made that up. So, um, you know, like that's, don't feel like you can, you, can, you can't Google that one and, and read up on that after. Um, but I think it kind of captures, you know, what I hope um, is a subtle but important shift that could happen um, with this litigation. So I think it's fair to say, and um, Eric, please correct me on this if I'm not right about this, um, that division of powers jurisprudence is really premised on the notion of dominion, right? So that is that judicial supervision of division of powers is about setting out those boundaries, right? The boundaries of the sandbox and ensuring that each level of government stays within its own sandbox, right? And then we deal with conflicts that might arise as a result of that. Um, but division of powers jurisprudence is not really about whether you play nicely within that sandbox, right? We have other areas of law that address those concerns. And I think it's important to just say that this is something different. What I have in mind here is something different from um, directly engaging with questions about whether this is good policy or not. That's not what I'm saying here, that courts should weigh in and consider that but rather, as you'll see from the arguments that are being presented to the court, that this is um, about thinking about other sources of constitutional obligation and how those inform or should inform um, division of powers analyses. 
So this is, in this case, there are a number of different arguments that are being asked by, uh, that are being put forward by intervening parties to reinterpret in some way sort of classical federalism questions alongside interlocking constitutional responsibilities. So colloquially, we might think of this as the Peter Parker principle being enshrined in, um, in, in Canadian federalism jurisprudence, right? The idea that with great power comes great responsibility. Um, but I think in the environmental context, thinking about it as a shift towards stewardship is really, um, would be an important shift in our thinking, right? So a shift that recognizes that constitutional interpretation of jurisdictional boundaries over environmental matters must also entail some obligation of stewardship for those environmental matters. And we can talk more about that in the Q&A, but really because so many things in the environment, and when you're dealing with environmental um, issues are transboundary issues. And so you cannot regulate that on that matter in a way that affect, you know, those outside of your jurisdictional boundaries, I think is one of the important, um, uh, important rationales for this. Um, and also thinking back to the beginning of my remarks, right, if we're approaching this from the perspective that Canadian environmental law is not very good, right, um, and yet environmental issues really are existential issues and have impacts that extend always beyond the local, um, we are really looking for the courts to, within, what, within the scope of their powers, uphold and enforce the best bits of Canadian environmental law um, and scrutinize the laws and the and implementation of laws that fall well short. And so in this case, what that might look like is that any inclusion of some notion of stewardship would work to reinforce and underscore the constitutionality of federal legislation. And importantly, and I'm completely um, complimenting and repeating what's already been said, also underscore provincial efforts that complement or exceed the measures that are put in place in, uh, by Parliament, and that those are also constitutionally uh, appropriate and permissible. So there's a number of ways in which this is being put to the court um, and how it could, how this idea of stewardship might sort of wind its way into reasons issued by the Supreme Court. So I'll give you three examples. First is uh, by, I, I guess, explicitly applying the living tree doctrine um, so a doctrine of constitutional interpretation that um, is the idea, entails the idea that while the Canadian constitution is rooted in the past, that quote, progressive interpretation accommodates and addresses the realities of modern life. So a quote from the Supreme Court of Canada in the same sex marriage reference. So the argument is that's being put to the court is that, hey, you actually have the ability within our constitutional tradition um, to embrace and adopt novel constitutional interpretation to respond to emergent social issues. We actually think the past environmental law cases already say this, but you court, if you don't think that, you should still do it anyways because of the living tree doctrine, right? So um, the argument would flow along those lines. Now, the living tree doctrine seems especially apt for addressing environmental matters, right? Especially ones that have existential dimensions like climate change. Um, and, you know, the fact that the court is being asked to consider in some ways um, future generations and the long-term survival of the Federation itself, right, thinking about the special vulnerability of the North and uh, Atlantic provinces in particular. Okay, so a possibility of common law and interpretive tools like the Living Treaty Doctrine finding uh, a way into this decision in a way that starts to imbue federalism doctrine with some understanding of responsibility. The second pathway um, is by reading sections 91 and 92 harmoniously with the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Um, in particular, here are the provisions that are being pointed to are section seven and section 15. So section seven, the charter guarantees the right to life, liberty and security of the person and not to be deprived thereof unless in accordance with principles of fundamental justice. And section 15 guarantees equal protection and equal benefit of the law without uh, discrimination on the basis of race, sex, age, and other you know, listed um, grounds of discrimination. So um, I guess what's being asked for here, um, and I'll show you a quote in a second, is really for the constitution to be read really harmoniously, right? Um, with, with the charter, um, charter obligations in mind as well. Um, these are particularly important provisions if we're thinking about children, future generations, um, women and racial minorities for whom there is very good evidence that they will be disproportionately harmed by the effects of climate change. 
And so here's an example of, um, uh, from one of the submissions sort of su summarizing the position here. So given the gendered implications of climate change, the division of powers must be interpreted in a manner that enables parliament and provincial legislatures to concurrently use the full extent of the legislative powers assigned to them in the constitution to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, to do otherwise risks rendering equality rights uh, formalistic and hollow. And then the third um, pathway towards uh, a constitutional responsibility finding its way into this, um, uh, this decision is that a number of interveners are arguing that, that a division of powers issues must be decided in a manner that protects section 35 rights. So constitutionally protected Aboriginal and treaty rights. And again, we know that the impacts of climate change on Indigenous peoples um, and the exercise of land-based rights are profound. Uh, we're already seeing this in Northern Canada and the you know, ability to, um, the inability to practice inherent rights due to the decline of species and changes on the landscape. And so the argument here is that for the federal government to do less than implement the GGPPA would violate the honor of the crown and would infringe section 35. And so lends further support to upholding the federal legislation as constitutional to ensure that we're reading right, the whole of the constitution harmoniously. Okay, so any one of those approaches, right? not enough on its own. I'm not suggesting that there's a, that there's a, a distinct line of argument here to anything that, um, uh, that's different from what's already been said, but really complementary um, reasoning that would be, I think, a really positive and useful development in Canadian environmental law were the court um, to uh, adopt one of these lines of reasoning to bolster that decision to uphold um, the federal legislation. Okay, so finally, um, we'll just turn to a different, different uh, dimension of constitutional interpretation of section 91 and 92. And that is the role of indigenous jurisdiction and disputes over climate change or the environment more generally. Um, and this is related but different to the perspective that I just shared, right? So I was sharing arguments along the lines of Section 35, focusing on Indigenous peoples as holders of Aboriginal and treaty rights that may or may not be violated by Canada. And rather here, the focus is on Indigenous peoples as governments, right? And how Canadian constitutional law can begin to chart a course towards cooperative federalism that includes Indigenous governments. And so there's a quote from um, the Council of the Haida Nation in a, in, in a case that was heard in January before the Supreme Court of Canada on amendments proposed by BC to the Environmental Management Act. So the clip that we're going to show you is from that hearing. It's not the carbon pricing hearing, um, but is dealing still with the division of powers issues over the environment. Um, and you're going to see that the arguments made by the Haida Nation in, in that case are really relevant. Um, to the issues that will be adjudicated on by the Supreme Court in this, in this case this week. Chief Justice, Justices, get us good say Lola Higgins, Terry Lynn Williams, Davidson, David Patterson, and Elizabeth Brobock appearing for the Council of the Haida Nation. The Haida Nation intervenes to highlight an issue of constitutional significance, the Indigenous role in cooperative federalism. While the province of BC has not framed the appeal to include this issue, Indigenous peoples and the Haida Nation stand to be profoundly affected by the outcome. Our submissions focus on that impact, drawing upon the experience of the Haida Nation. Haida Gwaii is recognized as a globally significant area containing some of the richest marine environments on this planet. The fact that it remains intact is because the Haida Nation has taken every step possible to do so, challenging both federal and provincial decisions that would have exploited Haida Gwaii beyond recognition. Over the last 40 years, the Council of the Haida Nation has worked hard to exercise its inherent responsibility to protect and manage human impacts of Haida Gwaii. This cultural and legal imperative is grounded in our deep connection to the land and sea of Haida Gwaii, fostered throughout millennia. With this solid grounding, we have made remarkable progress towards reconciliation. Before reconciliation was in common parlance in this country, 
The Haida Nation has not surrendered title, signed a treaty, nor completed its Aboriginal title lawsuit. Yet this court's decision in the Haida Nation case in 2004 created space for the exercise of Haida jurisdiction. The Haida Nation has concluded a number of agreements with Canada and BC for joint management of Haida Gwaii, which are summarized in paragraph 9 of our factum. These agreements collectively cover almost the entire land base, protect over half of the land base, and protect sizable portions of marine spaces. They acknowledge the Haida assertion of title and the fact that the Haida Nation is acting pursuant to its own legal jurisdiction and authority. Moreover, Haida laws, stated in the endangered Haida language, are expressly acknowledged as guiding collaborative management of marine spaces, as summarized in paragraph 11 of our factum. The Haida agreements provide for the exercise of complementary jurisdiction between the Haida Nation, the province of British Columbia, and the Government of Canada. They provide the preliminary architecture for Canadian cooperative federalism. Missing from both BC's and Canada's submissions is the requirement to provide jurisdictional space for Indigenous peoples to exercise inherent, jurisdiction, inherent responsibilities to the environment. Yet at issue in this case is the nature of Canadian federalism. The powers of governance are not exhausted by the division between federal and provincial jurisdiction under the Constitution Act of 1867. That act merely divided the powers that prior to its enactment had previously been assigned under imperial legislation. The right of Indigenous peoples to self-determination is no longer contested in Canada nor in the world. Indigenous peoples are part of Canada's constitution. Indigenous rights and title are inherent rights protected under Section 35 and the United Nations Declaration. Indigenous peoples' role in federalism is an unresolved part of Canada's long history of cultural genocide with Indigenous peoples. In our view, the paramountcy analysis is not helpful to addressing that legacy. The Haida agreements were made in the context of environmental protection of the land, the sea, and the creatures which depend on these. They are precisely the prioritization placed by Indigenous peoples generally, and the Haida in particular, that Professor John Burroughs has emphasized as vital to reconciliation, not only with Indigenous peoples, but reconciliation with the environment. It simply cannot be that after the Haida Nation's long journey towards reconciliation with both the governments of BC and Canada, that jurisdiction for environmental protection excludes the Haida Nation. In conclusion, the proposed legislation attempts to protect the environment. There must be room for Indigenous peoples to protect our citizens and our territories. For these reasons, we respectfully ask the court to decide this appeal in a manner that does not impinge upon Indigenous role in cooperative federalism and which expressly leaves that issue to be determined in another case with sufficient record. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello. I think we're back now. Have we, is everyone? Yeah, good. Well, thank you all very, very much for a very, very full discussion of the case that's going to be heard in the next two days. And so uh, I'm just going to remind our listeners or our uh, audience that if you have a question you'd like to ask, please just go to the bottom of your screen. There's a Q&A button there and you can just type your question in. If you have a specific person to whom you, you wish to address the question, just let them know. But otherwise, uh, we'll, I'm just going to read the questions and um, we'll, we'll ask our participants to, uh, to answer as they see fit. So we have a question specifically for Eric and that is, um, in broad strokes, the GGPPA allows provincial regulation of greenhouse gas emissions only if Canada approves the measures taken by the province. For, for example, part two of the GGPPA does not, allow, does, not, does not apply in Alberta because Canada has accepted Alberta's tier program as stringent enough. Assuming you are right that POG national concern 
can be used in concert with provincial jurisdiction in matters of greenhouse gas emission control, as you say, a matter of debate for the SEC, why is the GGPPA valid? It has the effect of allowing Canada to decide if the policy chosen by Alberta to deal with greenhouse gas emissions is stringent enough. There's no conflict in the traditional sense, but a subjective evaluation by Canada of the efficacy of the policy choice of the province. So Eric, what's your view on that? Thanks, uh, Pat, and, and thanks to the other uh, panelists uh, um, enjoyed all those presentations a lot. Um, and and uh, typical of uh, Margaret Unsworth, it's a particularly good question, and that's not surprising given, given her experience um, working with so many constitutional matters. So, um, Margaret, these are my thoughts, uh, and you may disagree with them, but here, here's my thinking. Um, the question, it seems to me, about the, the, the validity of the GGPPA has to be separated from a question about, to a certain extent, its modality or whether you think that that, that, that policy choice is a good one or, or bad one. But if you, say that, if you say that the federal government has the jurisdiction to enact such a price, then it would seem to me to be strange to say, but they don't have the jurisdiction to enact that price by the modality of a selective mechanism that says that they will evaluate whether or not a particular province meets the stringency requirements or not. That is, why would you say they, they might have that full power, but they don't have this less, uh, this more selective use of that power, which in effect is in fact, in some ways, maybe even more narrow. So for me, that's a policy choice. Uh, we might say that we would have preferred the government to just have a blunt instrument of this must be the case in all provinces. But from another perspective, you say, well, this actually allows for higher degree of cooperative federalism. It isn't being used as a blunt instrument. It's being used as a scalpel more than a throwing ax. And maybe that's exactly what we might want in terms of policy developments out of the federal government. But again, for me, those are the kinds of policy debates that I think, in my view, are disentangled or should be from a constitutional question of validity. If they have the power to do this, then they have it. Whether or not you or others think that it's a good or bad idea that they are exercising it in this manner, I think is not a constitutional issue. And I, I guess I'll just end with, with the idea that we know that there are other selective federal policies in, in existence across Canada. This would not be unique or the only moment in which the federal government exercises that kind of discretion. I'm thinking in particular, say, of, of employment insurance, which premiums kick in depending on the level of unemployment in a particular province um, or not. Here we say, I don't, I don't know if it's fair to say that this is just the federal government deciding who to pick on and who not to. If it has in law articulated a set of criteria that have to be met, then it seems to me that that's a, a legal mechanism that is available to the, to the valid exercise of jurisdiction. Good. Thank you very much. I think Jocelyn uh, wanted to add something to that. Yeah, just quickly, I'll add two two points to that. I think uh, I so I would just I guess I'd echo the remarks about this being, you know, a creative example of cooperative federalism. And so I think most people agree that um, the federal government does have constitutional jurisdiction under the criminal law power or under the um, tax power, trade and commerce, right? To do to take a blunter approach to implementing a national carbon price. Um, and so to the extent that the court has to consider right, prevent intrusion on provincial jurisdiction when it's doing this balancing act under POG, um, I think it's really useful to keep that in mind, right? That, uh, that this is actually a much lighter touch, right? That the, than the federal government um, uh, might otherwise be able to um, enact in a constitutionally permissible way. And I'll also just, uh, um, add that we shouldn't forget about sort of the lesser component of Canadian public law, which is administrative law, right? So those decisions by, uh, by cabinet to um, add or delist people from the schedule, provinces from the schedule, that's still governed by administrative law, right? And so if there is evidence of bad faith in the way that those decisions are being made, there is another area of law that would supervise the exercise of that power. Andrew, were you 
Yeah, I just wanted to, to pick up on really the first line of the question, which is the concept of the federal government allowing greenhouse gas emissions regulations in the province. And it's important that there's nothing in the GGPPA that says, for example, if the government had decided not to grant equivalency to tier, there was nothing there that said Alberta couldn't implement tier. It just said that the federal carbon price would apply as well. Um, and possibly that that federal carbon price would apply at a different level, but there was nothing that would say this is not a provincial policy that could be applied and would be operative, would be valid, et cetera. There's no paramountcy implication of having a, a facility pay two separate carbon charges. It might not be ideal from an economics perspective, but there's no, there's no failure to be able to comply with both pieces of legislation. If you had, for example, TIER and the GGPPA, could actually operate simultaneously without entering into any sort of conflict. Good, thank you very much. The next question is directed uh, at Jocelyn. Both the Saskatchewan and Alberta Court of Appeal decisions directly refused to deal with Section uh, 35. The Ontario Court of Appeal did not mention the Section 35 arguments. Uh, because of a lack of record, why do you think the Supreme Court of Canada is going to focus on that? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so I don't think the Supreme Court of Canada will focus on it. Um, I certainly don't think that that's going to be a centerpiece in any way in, the, in whatever decision comes down from the Supreme Court of Canada. But I do think that um, we should be asking for the court to say something productive on the issue, right? Um, you know, like at, at, I guess at the risk of circulating a bit of a cliche now, like it's 2020, you know, like there's Canada has um, signed the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, you know, we've got, we've got, it just, it, it, I think we've sort of hit a point where in constitutional jurisprudence over the division of powers that um, it, there's really no reason to keep ignoring um, the role of Indigenous jurisdiction or the um, rights of Indigenous peoples and the ways in which these decisions are being made. And so I don't think it'll be the focus. I don't think the court's gonna open some big new door but I do think that um, it would be appropriate and beneficial for the court to start to make a bit of a shift in indicating how we might think about this in the future when that record is before the court. I also would say that I think that, you know, at this point, um, there is enough that we know about the effects of climate change, particularly in the North and on Indigenous peoples, that, that there's a lot that we could take judicial notice of at this point, right? Um, you know, particularly if, if, if it's not what the case is centering on, um, you know, I don't know that we need to have a, a full record. And certainly the intervener arguments that are before the court um, provide, you know, quite a bit of examples um, for the court uh, to rely on in this case. Thank you. Um, all right, this is a very quick question. Who would bear the share, who would bear and share the burden of paying the carbon tax? Would it be based on equity? I guess that's probably a me question. Uh, it would be based on emissions, uh, largely, and that's kind of by design. And when you look at, at the consumer side, those with higher emissions will pay more in carbon price. Those with lower incomes will receive uh, more proportionately in terms of the rebates but the rebates are tied to income levels or they're lump sum to everybody. Uh, they're, not tied to, um, they're not tied to your emissions. So your net is, no matter where you are in Canada, if the GDPA, PPA applies, your net out of pocket is determined by your emissions. Uh, on the corporate side, again, it's the same story with the part two. The higher are your emissions or the low and the higher is your emissions intensity of output, the more the impact will be on your on your bottom line. Great. Thank you. Succinct. Now we have a, a question here from um, from someone you all know, I believe. I'm just going to name him. I don't generally do this, but Bruce Ryder says thank you to all of you for, for excellent presentations. His question is, if a majority of the court finds that the GGPPA is not a valid exercise of the national concern branch of POG or any other federal power, which is a very real possibility, how do you think Parliament should respond? Should Parliament enact temporary emergency legislation to address the climate crisis? 
uh, enact new environmental crimes, rely on its taxation power, all of the above? Maybe I'll take the first uh, shot here, Pat. Um, you know, the fact that uh, Bruce Ryder has disagreed with me about this particular issue of the National Concern Branch is one of those moments where, you know, you, it gives you pause because uh, uh, Bruce has thought about these issues a lot. So Bruce, I, I fo followed your, some of your commentary on this over the years. Um, and we may, we may differ, I think, on, on whether the National Concern Branch can be used in this manner or not. But um, I, one of the things I've always said is that we assume, I think, in this business that Supreme Court of Canada's function as endings, where I, I really don't think that that is the case. So no matter what occurs, this is actually still just a chapter in an ongoing constitutional story and environmental story that is going to be in our, our midst for a long time to come. So let's imagine a world in which, as you say, the Supreme Court of Canada says this is unconstitutional. This particular piece of legislation is invalid for these particular reasons. My own hunch is, is that in, in, in doing so, they would also signal pretty strongly, but here are the ways in which you might be able to uh, act constitutionally. And we saw something very similar, of course, in the securities reference from a decade ago. And guess what happened? The Supreme Court or the uh, federal parliament came back with legislation to deal with the systemic risk issues that were identified, spotlighted by the court in that case. And, and on the sequel, uh, the, the legislation is upheld. So um, my hunch is, is that there is broad power under the criminal law, broad power under the taxation law, um, uh, Andrew's doing some really interesting work on the powers that may exist under Section 91.2. There is a path, and uh, if there is a political will, uh, the, uh, the, the Parliament will find that path. That would, be my, that would be my prediction. And let's imagine that they say that this pr particular piece of legislation is valid. Well, that's not an ending either, because now we've got downstream stories about how it's going to interact with provincial jurisdiction. What about taking further steps? Um, there may be domains, as I say, of federal activity that, that go beyond its jurisdiction. And, and I would fully expect that, um, that this is going to be a file that uh, does not end for the foreseeable future. Okay, Jocelyn, did you want to? Yeah, add? thank you for that. And thanks um, for the question, Bruce. Although it is um, something that I'm not really fully willing to contemplate at this point in time, but I appreciate Eric, your really optimistic response to this. Um, I mean, I guess what I would add, what I would add is that uh, um, perhaps unsurprisingly, given how I approach environmental issues, I am somewhat persuaded by the emergency branch arguments that are being brought before the course in this, uh, the, before the court in this case. I don't. I don't, I certainly don't think that should be the basis of this decision, but I, I would, I, I could imagine very clearly a scenario where if this gets struck down, um, that parliament does feel emboldened to put in place something temporary that then actually shifts the playing field in a way that requires everybody to get to sit down, right, and work this out in a more cooperative way. And that's probably the best case scenario. I mean, the climate predictions, like this is my role on this panel, right, is to remind everybody that the climate predictions are really grim, right? And, um, you know, Andrew set this up nicely by looking at how good we are at, at setting objectives and then not meeting them. And, you know, we're coming up to a 2030 target that we're really not on track to meet. Um, I think in terms of, uh, you know, what kind of policy instrument would we see? I think we've seen that the federal government is very committed to a pricing instrument. Right, so that temporary legislation might be, um, you know, uh, that's sort of explicitly justified on emergency grounds. Um, I would expect, in some way, would rely on on, on a on a pricing mechanism um, that could then, you know, in my mind, you know, that is that is kind of harsh, right? To force everybody back to the table and to find a work a workable path forward. Well, okay, Andrew, did you want to briefly add something there? Yeah, I, I know we're running a minute over time yeah. here, but I think to me, I'm, I, I see the point about the emergency branch, although I'm, and I think there's lots of deference to parliament to determine what is and is not an emergency. I'm less optimistic about taxation given this framing, right? If we're framing it as a way to reduce emissions, I think that hamstrings the taxation branch a little bit. 
um, because it's not an income-based mechanism. And then I think we also need to remember that Certainly in, in a lot of the uh, emissions that we're really concerned about, they're very tied to provincial works or undertakings, and in some cases, provincial crown courts. So SAS power is the prime example there. That really does tie the hands of, of the taxation power. So I think there's lots of other routes, but I don't think a lot of them are as obvious as some people sort of push them out to be, say, well, yeah, absolutely, the, the government could do this or that. Okay, well, thank you all very much for, for uh, first of all, particip participants for your expertise, your knowledge, uh, and getting us ready for this two-day hearing before the Supreme Court of Canada. I have to say, I hope that those of you who are, who are watching uh, will, will, will watch the, uh, the hearings themselves. I think you've, you've got some really good background now to, to really engage with, what, with the arguments that are going to be made before the Supreme Court in the next couple of days. So I want to thank the three of you very much for the time you've taken and the detail with which you've, uh, you've, you've engaged the issues and really put a lot of questions to us. Uh, we, we really don't know what, how the court's going to, going to uh, respond and what it's going to decide, but uh, you've certainly made us think about some different aspects, different ways of, of looking at, uh, at the issues. So thank you all very much. I want to thank uh, the, those of you in the audience who have, uh, have participated. I also want to thank Alina Ritzma, our Public Legal Education Coordinator, and Martin Godhelp, who is our administrator for all their work in, in setting up the webinar and in advertising it. Thank you very, very much. And I want to remind all of you to please uh, fill out the little survey that comes your way by way of a link. We really appreciate your feedback. It, it helps us with our future programming. So uh, it looks as though from everything you've said that um, that this this court this decision the, the hearing and the decision of the court the eventual decision of the court will be quite historic it has every every you know there's no reason to believe it won't be a historic decision so um thank you for for letting us know what it's all about and it's interesting that we're going right back to 1867 constitution act 1867 and the division of powers there certainly the framers of that constitution act uh, never I uh, could have anticipated where we are today in 2020. So it's a good thing our constitution is a living tree or is interpreted.